Hi, everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about what it's like um, to come out to your car uh, after shopping in the mall all day on a hot summer day um, and what that means for life on Earth. Um, so let's start with the car. So when you go into a mall or any store or anywhere, um, you park the car and you roll up the windows, you lock up the car and you go inside. Now, when you come out, what is that car going to be like? Right. It's going to be hot. And if you think about it, comparing the temperature inside the car to just outside, same area, same weather, same temperature prediction for that day, inside the car is considerably hotter than outside the car. And yet it's in the same place. I mean, if you put a stone on the ground, in the parking lot, it would be the same temperature as the surrounding area, right? Um, so why is the inside of the car so much hotter? It should be about the same temperature as everything else, right? Because heat spreads out, right? <clears throat> to put it unscientifically. Well, the answer has to do with energy. If you look at that car, you'll see that the sunlight which is energy. Remember that photosynthesis plants trap sunlight energy. There's energy in that light. Sunlight energy, light can pass very easily through glass. When it hits matter, like a seat, it's converted to heat. You know this, you've been out on a sunny day, even in the winter, when the sun hits your face, which is matter, when the sun hits your face, it warms up. When light hits atoms, it's converted to heat. Well, in this case, the light passes through the window really easily, hits the, the um, steering wheel, hits the seats, and is converted to heat. That heat radiates back out, spreads out, to put it unscientifically, throughout the car. The key here, what makes the car different than right outside the car, is that glass does not easily let heat pass out. Um, it pours in as light much faster then it leaves as heat out of the windows. That's why we have windows in our houses. We can trap heat in our homes, but still let light in. Um, and so light or windows, excuse me, have a diff let different amounts of energy through it, depending on whether it's light or heat, which is fantastic. So you can drive and see and still keep your the inside of your car warm in the winter, but it has this effect of pouring, just like, like liquid pouring energy into the car converting it to heat and trapping it. Now, what does this have to do with life on Earth? Well, the same thing happens on Earth. If you think about the planet, we have basically a large window around us, something that lets light energy in, but traps it and does not let it pass out as easily as heat. And that's a layer of gases around the outside called greenhouse gases. Those greenhouse gases let the light pour in, way in, and then traps a lot of it. And like windows, not 100%, so some gets out. That's actually been great. Just like it's great to have windows on your car in your house, it's been great to have the greenhouse gas windows around our planet. It's allowed us to be warm enough that we're not like um, Pluto, and life has been able to evolve because we've trapped enough heat and it's kept it warm. Now, I'd like to imagine a different analogy. What's been ideal is like, imagine a hot summer night and you maybe want just a sheet on, right? It's just enough to keep a chill off, but it doesn't trap too much heat, right? That's what we've had for tens of thousands of years, a perfect sheet. And suddenly, we'll talk about how it's happening. Suddenly, it's not a sheet anymore. Now it's an additional blanket and another blanket and another blanket and seven comforters in the middle of summer on top of you. Now you're trapping way more heat, still letting light in because these are greenhouse gases that let the light energy pour in, but now it's really thick layer and it's trapping way more heat than it used to. That's what's causing the planet on average to warm. And as you warm the planet, you change the way weather works. You change where, which water is evaporating where and where it's coming down. And you change all sorts of things about the way that the oceans behave and ice behaves. And you get climate change. That is the climate, the, 
the, the weather that you would expect changes on the planet because you've warmed it on average and moved everything around in different ways than it used to. And that's a big problem because as we've just talked about, species have evolved over millions of years, generation after generation, picking the traits that are perfect for a particular environment. That was the environment with the sheet. Now we have seven comforters and there's a ton of stuff that has not had millions of years to choose to have mutations happen and choose the right mutations to keep up with the changes. And so we're going to see a lot of problems with living organisms, with living systems on the planet. Now, where are the, where's this blanket coming from? Well, this blanket is, um, well, the sheet and the blanket, all of that is greenhouse gases. That's carbon dioxide and methane um, and some other gases that are around the planet. So this, these, are, these are gases um, that are letting the light in and trapping the heat. And we have a certain level of carbon dioxide. Um, the measurement for this is called parts per million. So up until the 1880s, we had 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in this atmosphere. Doesn't really matter what the number is, but that was the sheet, 280. Um, we're now at about 415, give or take. It changes each season. We can talk about that later. But we have nearly, you know, doubled, well, added, not quite doubled, but added a huge amount of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, um, to the greenhouse gas layer, and we're trapping significantly more energy in the form of heat. Where is that carbon dioxide coming from? Well, we exhale it, right? But we were doing that for tens of thousands of years, and that was maintaining we and cows and deer and everything else that releases carbon dioxide from respiration, right? It's been putting that out in the atmosphere for, for a long time, and that naturally occurs and made the level that was the sheet. But we started doing something differently around 1880 that added significantly more carbon dioxide. We started drilling down into the ground and taking dead dinosaurs, dead plants from hundreds of millions of years ago that had been compacted down and started burning them. That stuff that compacted dinosaurs and plants are fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas. We start burning them. And when you burn them, you release carbon dioxide. Well, we burn them to make electricity and we burn them to make cars go and we burn them for manufacturing. And we started releasing all over the planet, started just pumping carbon dioxide out and methane, which is another greenhouse gas, and putting it out there and making the, um, the blanket very, very heavy. Why is that a problem? Well, we started melting uh, the polar ice caps. Um, and you can take a look right here. You can see um, that the polar ice caps, this is in 1990, what the Arctic ice looked like. That white stuff is very old ice, very thick, um, and it would last through the summer. Um, and it's been melting. And if you watch, but here we are at 1998, we still have a lot of the white old ice. The blue stuff is the thinner new ice that comes each season. Um, and you can see even in 2002, 2003, when you guys were born, it was still pretty significantly there. Um, 2006, it's still there. It's thinning out. Oh, 2007, 2008, it's starting to really melt. We can see these huge changes. Oh my gosh, look at 2013, 12 and 13. It's just about gone. The old ice is gone. That means in the summer, there's very, very little ice. What's the problem with that? Well, ice, when it's white, reflects light back out. Ice, when it's dark, absorbs heat. So the, I, the poles are now increasing the rate at which we warm the planet simply because they've turned from white to blue black and dark and different colors, but they're not white and reflecting the way they used to. And the other big problem is that they're melting and adding water to the oceans, which is raising the sea level, which is causing all kinds of problems in places like Miami. They're actually pumping out water out of Miami because it's just pouring in. And we're gonna see a lot of problems with sea level rise. And one of the problems is during storms. The storm surge causes problems like this. This is in New York. Um, this was with um, the extreme uh, storm, super, sand, super storm Sandy 
that pummeled us. And then there was Lee and Irene. There were a bunch of different hurricanes that just pushed tons of water in um, to New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and caused huge damage. And the reason that it was able to do that was that the sea level is higher. And so more water is available to be pushed up further. Um, and we're seeing all sorts of problems, not just higher sea levels. We're also seeing much more, um, many more uh, extreme weather events. If you add heat to the oceans, which we've been doing, just like the rest of the planet, that heat is um, intensifies storms like hurricanes. Um, we're also uh, where you heat land, you dry it out, um, and lots of water evaporates, and then that water um, evaporates out of the ground, that area becomes very drought ridden, that water may fall somewhere else constantly and flood. And we're seeing a lot of problems where water used to be falling that it isn't and water that used to not be falling it is and we're getting droughts in some places and floods in others. Um, and so we're seeing lots of problems. One of the things that comes with drought is forest fires. We've had horrible forest fires. If you remember Australia, had terrible, terrible fires. And before that, California, just in this last uh, year. Um, so we're seeing lots of problems associated with the warming. Um, and then we have lots of changes in the behaviors of organisms. If you think about flowers, flowers are pollinated by bees. Well, flowers are more likely to bloom based on the day length of light. They know it's spring by how long the daylight is. Bees know how when to come out and pollinate based on the temperature. Those two, they evolved to coordinate those exactly the same. Now it's totally out of kilter. The bees think it's time to come out before the plants think it's time to bloom. And so we're seeing lots of problems with sexual reproduction in plants. And that is a terrible problem for food, for the entire food chain. So that's a big problem. So what do we do? Well, there's a lot of solutions and you'll see um, in the next video a lot about those solutions. Um, but one of the things we need to do is deal with electricity. Electricity, we've been generating electricity, burning coal and burning gas, and that releases a lot of carbon dioxide and um, has other problems associated with them. And so if we can stop burning coal and gas, um, and in some countries oil is used for electricity, and we can replace it with ways to make electricity without carbon dioxide emissions, then we will be able to continue to have electricity. We don't have to live in caves. We can continue to have electricity, but without generating carbon dioxide emissions um, or methane emissions uh, from, from gas fracking. So these are some possible alternatives. Nuclear is a surprise. Most people don't realize that nuclear energy is carbon free, essentially, when once it's built, once the plant is built, it releases no carbon emissions. It has other problems associated with it, with waste, but it's controversial. And many climate scientists actually say that nuclear is important. Certainly dams, hydroelectric energy, we get um, here in New York, a lot of electricity from Canada and from Niagara Falls that is generated by hydro, which means that we have um, very low carbon emissions electricity here in New York compared to the rest of the nation because we got hydro and we've got nuclear. Um, we are starting to build out wind and solar, but it's still a tiny percentage of our electricity. Um, another thing is how much we consume. Every time, every time you buy anything, it took energy to produce it. Um, it took energy to move it. It takes energy to get rid of it. And so reducing the amount of consumption that we do matters. Um, and one of the most intensive things that we consume a lot of is meat. It takes an, in, raising cattle, um, in particular beef, um, releases an immense amount of carbon, of greenhouse gas emissions. And so cutting down the amount of meat that you eat has a big difference. Um, and then Instead of driving cars that burn gas, you can drive cars that use electricity. And if you've gotten rid of the coal and the gas, you're driving without emissions. You can do the same thing with heating your house. You can use something called heat pumps and those um, use electricity to heat and cool your home. And if you do that and you have gotten rid of coal, oil and gas for burning, for making electricity, you now can heat your home without emissions. You can cook using electricity. And then if you've gotten rid of the coal, oil, and gas, you now have um, 
cooking without emissions. So there's lots of ways that we can have solutions um, to these problems and we can continue to live a modern lifestyle while eliminating our carbon emissions if we're smart about it. Now, a lot of times, a lot of folks will say, well, you just, we just all have to do this. Why aren't we just doing it? And the reality is if you look at the pandemic today, um, we cut emissions by something like 30 to 40% in New York City um, during this pandemic. We stopped, we stopped driving, we stopped buying so much and the emissions plummeted. Was closing down New York City good for us? No, people um, are having trouble making a living and are worried about where their next paycheck is coming from and they're not able to pay rent. And our entire economy depends on um, energy. And right now our energy comes from carbon intensive sources. So if we want to prevent future warming, which is really important because it's apparently going to get a lot worse if we continue. Um, if we want to stop that, we not only have to stop consuming as much, we need to collectively together make decisions that decarbonize our economy. And that comes to corporations and government and international agreements and not just personal decisions. That said, personal decisions are really important too. And you can find ways to cut your own emissions that will not only cut your own emissions, but encourage others to do the same, including our policymakers. And so uh, with that, uh, I will lead you up to see the next video, which is a wonderful video about uh, how serious this is, but also the solutions that are available.